Good Sabbath, brethren, to everyone that is assembled here on this beautiful Sabbath day, and to those brethren that are in the electronic media. We really thank Yahweh for the improvements that have been made, and as we continue to refine the product of this ministry, we pray that you will stay tuned and you will continue to give your feedback. Last first day of the week, when we reprogrammed the transmitter, I once went on air, began to look, see where it was being received, and it was Prince Edward Island was just hammering in beautifully on 15150, first thing in the morning, and then went over to Ireland and Northern Ireland. It sounded great all through Europe, but it wouldn't make it into Dubai. Usually there's a receiving station in Dubai that receives it pretty strongly, and then down in Cyprus it wasn't really coming in too well. I was, I was kind of disappointed, so I went back over to the office, I pulled the propagation charts, and realized that we're not shooting toward Europe at that point. We're covering the United States and South. So then I began to look at the United States, and all the way up into British Columbia, the signal was just beautifully clear, and down to New Zealand and Australia. Very good, strong signal. So the reports came in this week. I actually got an email Sunday morning from an individual in Germany. He said, what are you doing on 15150? He said, I always listen to you on 9275, but this is a beautiful signal, and it's a good time of the day in Europe to listen to it early afternoon. And he was really encouraged, and we're thankful for that. But we got reports all through the week about the refinements we can make and the, to try to get the word of Yahweh out across the world in an increased manner. Elder Meyer always said, try to make the best better. And that's what we're striving to do so that we can be ready when those individuals begin to, in earnest, look for Yahweh's truth. And we're just thankful to do so. So, good Sabbath, everyone. We're encouraged by the events of the past week, and we look forward to the next. It's going to be a pivotal week, we feel, and we'll see how it goes. But... According to Yahweh, Yahweh's in control. Yahweh sets up and he brings down. And we look forward to the peace of Yahshua when he returns. The title of the message this morning is Powers in the World. During this time of the year, of course, we all experience, now that our eyes are open to the truth of the sacred scriptures, the great paganism that is promulgated during this time of year. All around us, the celebration of Halloween is very prevalent. Some areas, they go all in on this Halloween celebration. But when we turn to Leviticus 23, verse 37, Almighty Yahweh shows us exactly what we are supposed to be observing. These are the set feasts of Yahweh, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations, to offer an offering made by fire to Yahweh, a burnt offering and a meal offering, a sacrifice and drink offerings each on its own day, besides the Sabbaths of Yahweh, and besides your gifts, and besides all your vows, and besides all your free will offerings which you give to Yahweh. This is at the conclusion of listing the Passover memorial, Feast of Unleavened Bread, Pentecost, Shavuot, the Feast of Trumpets, Fast of Atonement, Feast of Tabernacles, and the Last Great Day. Those are the set feast, the Moedim, the called out observance from Almighty Yahweh. Nowhere here you find any observance of the, Passover, the Halloween celebration that we just experienced. Finding in the history of Halloween a paragraph that really struck me, I decided to bring it forward this morning. The Druids celebrated this holiday with great fire festival to encourage the dimming sun not to vanish. The people danced around bonfires to keep evil spirits away, but left their doors open in hopes that the kind spirits of loved ones might join them around their hearths. On this night, divination was thought to be more effective than any other time, and they actually stayed in another area where they felt the veil between the physical world and the spiritual world was at its thinnest. And that was the time that they should be doing these things to try to encourage this interaction. This was written by Von Dale Chamberlain from the University of Utah. Another paragraph I'll cite. When local people converted to Christianity during the early Middle Ages, the Roman Catholic Church often incorporated modified versions of older religious traditions in order to win converts. 
That is a very powerful statement. It's something that we've heard in the assemblies of Yahweh for decades. How those in Christianity sought to meld pagan worship together with their beliefs in order to expand their ranks. Pope Gregory IV wanted to substitute the Samayan with All, Day's Saint, All Saints Day in 835, but All Souls Day, November 2nd, which is closer in resemblance to Halloween today, was first instituted at a French monastery in 998, less than a millennia after Yahshua died, here is rank and utter paganism brought into another Circe. And it quickly spread throughout Europe. This is the Encarta Encyclopedia of Learning and Research. Of course, in the Assemblies of Yahweh, we don't have anything to do with Halloween because we understand its pagan roots. We don't engage with the tra traditions of this world. But this message is not about Halloween. We understand it's pagan and it can be quickly identified as such. But what we want to consider is the powers in this world that are moving to accomplish the will of the one who sent them. It's something we must always consider because as we understand that Yahweh is our Elohim, Yahshua died for our sins, we have a job to identify between the good and evil. This goes all the way back to the book of Genesis. Turn for an opening passage and to Colossians 1, and let's begin in verse 9. Colossians 1, 9. For this cause we also, since the day we heard, do not cease to pray and make requests for you, that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding, to walk worthily of Yahshua to all pleasing, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of Yahweh, strengthened with all power according to the might of his glory, to all patience and long suffering with joy, giving thanks to the Father who made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints of light, who delivered us out of the power of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of the Son of his love, in whom we have our redemption, the forgiveness of our sins, who is the image of the invisible Yahweh, the firstborn of all creation. For in him were all things created in the heavens and upon the earth, things visible, things invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all these things have been created through him and to him. And he, and he is th uh, before all things, and in him all things consist. Now there are some very powerful words here that we must consider and look more deeply at the definitions. You're able to see here how in verse 11 we, are we must be strengthened with his power. That word power is 1411, dunamis. We've heard many messages spoken on this power from Almighty Yahweh. Defined as a source, specifically a force, specifically a miraculous power. It comes from 1410 to be able to do something, to be possible or strength. Let's reread that with that consideration, to be strengthened in the opportunity to do something, dunamis, to produce something, a strength, something that, according to Yahweh's word, will grow, a fruit that will bear, an action that will bear fruit. The next word we want to consider is patience. Patience is cheerful endurance. The word perseverance is defined as perseverance, steadfastness in the, shot, in the face of adversity. And that's what this is, patience, cheerful endurance. We all endure trials, tribulations, but how do we take them? How do we move forward and how do you, through these times of adversity, come out of the other side on an even keel? The next word, with long suffering, with joy. And what is joy? Cheerfulness, coming from the source, the root of being enabled, able to do something through your cheerfulness. For Yahweh has given us sons of light, delivered us out of the power 
of darkness. Now the power here is not 1411, dunamis. This power from Almighty Yahweh, which will give us strength. This power is 1849. And it is the power of choice. Now think about that. The power of choice of darkness. He brought us out of an opportunity to do sin, a desire to look at the other side, and to give us the light of his truth. In Genesis 3, we see this power of choice interjected into humankind. In verse 4, the serpent said unto the woman, you shall not surely die. For Elohim knows that in the day you eat of it, then your eyes shall be opened and you shall be as Elohim, knowing good and evil. And we're going to consider this topic a little more in the future of this message. The opportunity to know good, but also dabble into the evil. This is what Yahweh has translated us out of, translated us into the kingdom and the son of his love in Colossians chapter 1. Truly, Yahweh has given us an opportunity to separate ourselves from this worldly system. But through these things, Yahweh has given us also a great gift. In verse 16, for in him were all things created, in the heavens and upon the earth, things visible and things invisible, whether thrones. Let's consider the word throne. The word throne here is a seat of power. It's a seat of power and control. But the word is based on the concept of a seat that has a footstool. And when you turn to Isaiah 66, verse 1, in this manner says Yahweh, heaven is my throne, the earth is my footstool. What manner of house will you build me? If Yahweh is the Elohim and king, then his throne is in heaven as Yahshua sits at his right hand, and his footstool under his control is the earth. So should not we lift him up as the one that is in control of our future? And how do we get into a state of acceptance so that when the prophecies are fulfilled and the day of Yahweh arrives, that we can go forward into his kingdom? Whether there be thrones, or dominions. The word dominion is 2962, and it is supreme in authority, a master or a lord. Principalities. Principality is designed as a commencement of an event or thing, first in order of town, time, but then we go to powers. Once again, the word power which we saw as a freedom or a choice, the power of making your own decision what you want to do. So as we saw, Yahweh is, is the Elohim. He sits in heaven. He is dominion. He has control over all things. He is the first and the last, the principality. And he has given us an opportunity to use his power, dunamis, to develop ourselves into a child of his. But let's look at the converse because Paul says here that there are things in heaven and in earth. So let's look about the throne of the adversary who controls the systems of this world. Let's look at his power, the power over individuals' hearts, the power over directions of people that are living in this earth. The principalities, the way that they think, the thought process, the order of time in which they place themselves, or, and then culminating in, the power of choice. You're able to see here how there can be, in heaven and in earth, these things. One is true, and one is a resemblance of that truth. All things, continuing in verse 16, have been created through him and to him. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with Yahweh. Yahshua the Messiah, in his pre-existent state, was at creation. 
And he was able, by his, by Yahweh's guidance, to move us and give us the keys that we can use to move ourselves closer. In verse 17, he is before all things, and in him all things consist. The reason that we place Almighty Yahweh's Messiah, his son, as paramount in our life. Turn to Isaiah 45. In Isaiah 45, beginning in verse 5, is a passage that we get many time, questions many times because individuals can't quite understand this. If Yahweh is good, then how can this passage be in the sacred scriptures? In verse 5 of Isaiah 45, I am Yahweh and there is no one else. Speaking of the great, majestic, almighty, heavenly father Yahweh, as called by his own name. Besides me, there is no Elohim. A very cut and dried statement. There is no mighty one except Almighty Yahweh. So what are the other things that we consider on earth? Yahweh continues by saying, I will gird you, though you have not known me, that they may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is no one besides me. I am Yahweh, and there is no one else. Okay, we understand that. Statement of doctrine begins as such. Our belief system, the basis of our faith is that Yahweh is our Elohim. Continuing in verse 7, I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create evil. I am Yahweh that does these things. Now how can this passage be in the sacred scriptures to say that Yahweh creates darkness? Yahweh creates evil. When you take a pause and begin to look at the word formations, and the definitions, it becomes patently clear what Yahweh means. The word form, to create, the word make, to create, are planted into this passage in verse 7. The word form, 3335, is to squeeze into shape, to take something and squeeze it into shape or mold it, like a potter. A person being in the hand of the potter when they're making a vessel, and it is marred. They have that capability of reforming it and squeezing it into something else. The word make, remember. He says here, I form the light, I make peace. The word make, 6213, to do, fashion, accomplish, or to produce. Both these words have the implication of taking an element, Something that in and of itself is nothing and assembling it into another being, another individual. Take the red clay, the red dirt, and Yahweh brought that to himself and he assembled it into Adam. He came from the dust. But then let's look at the word create. I form the, I form the light and create darkness. The word create here is 1257, bara, to create, shape, or form, i.e. to cut down. The implication is you take a tree, you cut down the tree, you saw up the wood, you make boards out of it, and you assemble it into a cabinet. That is what created creation is in relationship to this word, 1254, bara. Now we can understand a little bit more. Yahweh took the elemental forms of this world in mankind, take mankind for instance. He created them. But then on the flip side of that, there is a possibility if actions are taken that that can be cut down and formed into something else. Yahweh formed the light. That light was perverted in Genesis 1 as the earth had become waste and void. Yahweh makes peace, true shalom, being at rest, being at comfort in your state. He makes that peace, but if you unplug certain aspects of that peace, then you have the Yetzer, hara, the evil inclination, the hara, the evil that is the reflection 
of the peace, the shalom that Yahweh has made. It goes to figure that you have something good that Yahweh created, but if a change is made by another force added into that, it can be for the evil. Now, we already went to Genesis chapter 1. We saw how Satan, the adversary, did that. So we were able to understand that Yahweh's creation was beautiful, but there was a change that was made. So what was that change? What is that other power that is put into Yahweh's perfect creation? Of course, we stick in the word. We just completed verse 7. So let's look at verse 8. Distill you heavens. Now remember in Deuteronomy, the word distill from heaven is a soft rain, which is the doctrine. Yahweh's doctrine distills into the soft grass of this earth, into the soft heart of an individual. Distill you heavens from above and let the skies pour down righteousness. What is righteousness? Righteousness is believing Yahweh and trusting in his word. Let the earth open that it may bring forth salvation. So when the doctrine comes into a soft heart, and when it turns into a righteous individual, then your body, your, the earth where you live, opens to righteousness and salvation. And let it cause righteousness to spring up together. I, Yahweh, have created it. What a beautiful passage of scripture, because even though powers go in and change things, when an individual makes decisions to be a righteous individual, then that change will keep them in Yahweh's grace. But then when, Yahweh, when an individual takes the gifts of Almighty Yahweh and allows another power to enter into his life, then there's a reflection of the good, but it becomes converse to the ways of Almighty Yahweh to form, to make, and to create. It all hinges on righteousness. And righteousness is obedience to our Heavenly Father, Yahweh. Cut and dried. There's no two ways to look at it. So let's go back to Colossians 1. And let's look at verse 17 once again. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. This is... Almighty Yahweh creating good, creating something good. Speaking of Yahshua the Messiah, the firstborn of creation. In verse 18, he is the head of the body, the assembly who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. So here you have described a perfect individual that was created first and foremost by Almighty Yahweh. And this individual did certain things and made the correct choices and has now become the head of an assembly. It goes to the one doctrine that we, the assembly of Yahweh espouse. The one doctrine belief that Almighty Yahweh has one congregation that he, through history, has been fostering to become the group of individuals to inhabit his kingdom. It is led by Yahshua the Messiah, who did no sin or no guile, was found in his mouth. He had an upright life. Yahshua is the head of the assembly. So who is the head of the assembly that I read of a description in Christianity that perverted the truth so that they could get more individuals? It stems back to that word from the adversary in Genesis 3. He said unto the woman, has Elohim said, you shall not eat of any tree of the garden? And she said, of course, replied, yes, we can eat of the one in the middle. The serpent said unto the woman, you shall not surely die. You're not going to die on the day that you eat the fruit. He knew that. He knew how Yahweh is a loving, mighty one. But that destruction would begin. Here you have Yahshua as the head of the assembly, truth and uprightness, and then you have the adversary as another individual that is corrupting the pure words of Yahweh. 
Verse 19, let's continue to enlighten this passage. For it was the good pleasure of the Father that in him should all the fullness dwell, and through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his torture stake. Through him, I say, whether things upon earth or things in the heavens. And you, being in time past alienated and enemies in your mind and in your evil works. There, so Yahshua the Messiah made peace with the flesh, living perfect life. And upon his death, then, that power from Almighty Yahweh has translated into the opportunity and power that we can partake of that shed blood of the Messiah. Yet he is now reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and without blemish and unreprovable to and unreprovable before him. Through Yahshua the Messiah, then, we have the power of choice. Even though each one of us has sinned and fallen short of the grace and the glory of Almighty Yahweh, we have the power and choice to accept at face value the words that can afford us entrance into his kingdom if we are so blessed and if Yahweh is merciful to us. In 1 Corinthians 8, beginning in verse 4, Consider, concerning, therefore, the eating of things sacrificed to idols, we know that no idol is anything in the world and that there is no Yahweh but one. He's just quoting the prophet Isaiah. That's what Paul's quoting. For though there be called mighty ones, whether in heaven or in earth, you see that duality in mighty ones in heaven or in earth, or there are many mighty ones and many lords, yet to us there is one Elohim, the Father of whom all things, and we to him, and one master, Yahshua the Messiah, through him were, are all things, and we through him. What Paul's saying is, we understand that there are idols in the world. We understand that there are mighty ones, principalities in this world, many supreme in leaders, but there is only one Yahweh. So how do we identify how do we identify which leader we are following? Are we going to follow the adversary who takes us away from Yahweh's words? Or will we follow the pure Messiah? We, ident we can identify the origin of this attitude in Ezekiel 28, beginning in verse 13. Ezekiel 28, 13 says, you were in Eden, the garden of Elohim. Now, there are very clearly defined individuals in the, in the garden of Eden. Yahweh had created Adam and Eve and had placed them in the garden. Wherever they were created, Yahweh then created a garden of Eden and placed them in the garden. It says, the voice of Elohim was walking in the garden. Now, man has never seen Almighty Yahweh, so that has to be that great intermediary, Yahshua the Messiah, in his pre-existent state, that was teaching, working with mankind to instruct them on the ways of Yahweh. And then there was the adversary. The only four things that were identified as being in the Garden of Eden. We know this is not Yahshua the Messiah. We know it's not Adam and Eve. So this can be identified as Satan. You were in Eden, the Garden of Elohim. Every precious stone was your covering. And then it lists the stones of the breastplate, except for one row. Very similar to the high priest's breastplate, but not complete. A little bit different, a little bit lacking, but very, very similar. Verse 14. Well, let's go back up. The workmanship of your tabrets and your pipes were in you in the day that you were created. They were prepared. You were the anointed cherub that covers. Now, in the bottom of the ark over there, you're able to see a representation of the ark that was carried by the Levitical priesthood. On top were the two cherubim. And one of those depicted there was faithful, and one was not. You were anointed cherub that covers. I set you so that you were upon the holy mountain of Elohim. You walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. You were there through all this creative activity. You were close to Elohim. And as the book of Job says, you were actually in his very throne room. 
You were perfect in your ways. That's how Yahweh creates things. Perfect in your ways that you were created. Till unrighteousness was found. The word found here is not a judgment where Yahweh had to look at something or look at what he was doing deep into his heart. But it means to come forth. Unrighteousness comes forth from the individual. Why was Yahshua described as having no sin and no guile found in his mouth? Because his doctrines were pure. The things that he spoke of the time that he lived in, the time of the trial and the time of the kingdom were pure. Here an individual had unrighteousness found in him. By the abundance of your trade, and now here are some keys. The word trade here is merchandise. By the abundance of your trade, they filled. Now they filled the middle of you. This guy got arrogant. He got pumped up. He began to think through the things that he was doing, accomplishing for Yahweh's honor and glory, that, they, that through him, these things were taking place. And his heart then began to get arrogant, and it was filled with violence. And you have sinned. Therefore have I cast you out as profane out of the mountain of Elohim. Isaiah 14 says so many times a repetitious per personal pronoun, I, 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 I have done these things. I can ascend into the hill of Yahweh. I can take over Yahweh's throne. This individual had a strain of arrogance and sin in his life, and he fell short. Verse 17, your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You have corrupted your wisdom by reason of your brightness. There were things that took place that corrupted that individual. Halel, Satan. Now let's contrast Matthew 3. Matthew 3, 13, then comes Yahshua from Galilee to the Jordan to John to be immersed of him. He went out to John the Immerser. And in verse 16, Yahshua, when he was baptized, went up straightway from the water. And lo, the heavens were open to him. And he saw the spirit of Yahweh descending as a dove, coming down upon him. And lo, a voice out of the heavens saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And Yahshua was led up by the spirit. He had a job to do and testing had to be done. Are you going to allow the powers of this earth to overcome you? And the adversary came to him. The tempter came. Using the same words, if. Is this what Yahweh said? If you eat the tree in the garden, you will not die. If you are the son of Elohim, command these stones to be made to bread. Yahshua answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone. But by every word, going right back to the righteousness. Yes, we want to be sons of Elohim, but it is not our doing. That's what Yahshua was saying. Then the devil takes him to the holy city, sets him on the pinnacle of the temple and says, If you are the son of Yahweh, cast your down, yourself down. And he quotes scriptures of protection. And he quotes scriptures on being born up as a gift from almighty Yahweh. But Yahshua says to him, again it is written, you shall not make trial of Yahweh your Elohim. And then the third time, he takes him to a very high mountain, governmental control. And he shows him the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. All these things I will give you. There are powers in heaven, powers that are given by Almighty Yahweh, and there are powers on earth that are given by the adversary. He said it blatantly to Yahshua. You want to have power? I'll give it to you if you fall down and worship me. Then says Yahshua to him, Get you hence, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship Yahweh your Elohim, and him only shall you serve. The devil left him. Satan was vanquished, and Yahshua triumphed. And he did it only because he loved Yahweh. He chose the correct power. He chose the one, the great Elohim, almighty Yahweh. The word of Yahweh is filled with many prophetic events. 
And these prophetic events are fulfilled by Almighty Yahweh, and they are fulfilled by time and preparation. You can see this taking place in Luke 2. Luke 2, beginning at verse 25. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was righteous. Simeon means the one who has heard or has listened. And this man was righteous and devout, looking for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. He was being led because he was obedient to Yahweh. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he should not see death before he had seen Yahweh's Messiah. The preparation part of Yahweh's doing to bring the Messiah here to this earth had been foretold by Yahweh's movement. He will do nothing unless he informs his servants, the saints. There was a preparation part where Yahweh made it known that the Messiah is coming. Who else understood that the Messiah was coming? Satan, the adversary. He understood that there was a messianic figure coming who would be perfect, who would triumph where he had failed. And he began to take action also. And he began to implant demonic attitude and demonic events into the land where Yahshua would have to confront. In Mark 1, beginning in verse 32, And at evening when the sun set, they brought him out all that were sick and all that were possessed with demons. Is it possible for an individual to be possessed with a demon and they all gather together and Yahshua the Messiah casts them out? Now what do you expect a demon is? Is a demonic activity something like alien? Remember the movie Alien where all of a sudden their whole chest splits open and some evil thing comes out? No. It is an individual that is speaking something against the word of Almighty Yahweh. These demons, we understood, fell to their knees and understood who Yahshua was. Mark 4, 40. And he said to them, why are you fearful? Have you not yet faith? And they feared exceedingly. And he said to one another, who is it that the wind would even obey him? Mark 1, 21. And he went into Capernaum and straightway on the Sabbath day, he entered the synagogue and taught. He's in the synagogue of Capernaum, his hometown, his center of operations, where they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as having authority and not as the scribes. And straightway there was in the synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. A demon was in an individual in the congregation. And he cried out, saying, What have we to do with you, Yahshua, you Nazarene? Have you come to destroy us? All the times through the sacred scriptures, that a demon addressed Yahshua. It was, you are the son of Elohim. You have power. What are you going to do with us? In Mark 5, 1 to 14, legion, an individual that had a legion of demons. And that can be identified as 1 to 6,000. And it ran into 2,000 hogs and ran into the sea when Yahshua cast them out. But they understood what Yahshua was. So how do we, in the assemblies of Yahweh today, stand against demonic activity? We have a gift. We have a gift that you can see in Acts 1. And he said to them in verse 7, It is not for you to know times and seasons which the Father has set within his own authority, but you shall receive power. And this word power is once again... A miraculous power, dunamis, you shall receive a power from on high. Not the power of choice, but a power from Yahweh through the Holy Spirit that has come upon you. And you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria. After that Pentecost message that Peter gave to the individuals around them, where he concluded it with saying in verse 36 of chapter 2, 
All the house of Israel therefore shall know assuredly that Yahweh has made him both king and Messiah, this Yahshua whom you impaled. And they were struck at the heart. And they said, what can we do? Peter said to them, repent. Use that free choice and choose the power of Almighty Yahweh, not the power here in demonic activity on the earth. And be baptized. Make your covenant with him. And when you make your covenant with him, you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit when you have been cleansed from your sins. Then that gift of the Holy Spirit will have an effect on our life. And that effect, Yahshua very simply said in John 14, 25, These things have I spoken to you while yet remaining with you. But the Comforter, even the Holy Spirit, which the Father will send in my name, it will teach you all things. By utilizing the Holy Spirit then, the word of Yahweh opens up and is revealed to us. And it will bring to remembrance all that I said to you. How Yahshua lived. How he instructed us to walk. And then the powers on earth are vanquished. The powers of earth are done away. In Revelation 20. Revelation 20:10, 20, And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, in which are also the beasts and the false prophet, and it shall be tormented for day and night for the ages of ages. In chapter 21, I saw a new heaven. That power has been destroyed. The power of Almighty Yahweh, of right, the power of righteousness, of truth, the power that is described through the Holy Spirit in Galatians 5 is then evident in every individual that is able to enjoy the new heaven and the new earth that comes down from on high. May Yahweh continue to bless us, stay strong, because the adversary is a wily devil. But by using Yahweh's word, by allowing us to be solidified together in the Holy Spirit, we then are able to continue on in peace, endurance, patient endurance to the kingdom of Yahweh. Yahweh bless you.